Good Evening, Goodbye Forever, Volume 2 by Nat Chang Rinpoche, Chapter 4, Part 1. Them That Weave the Wind. The first term was entirely engaging. I worked at illustration projects with enthusiasm, even though they concerned subjects which were only of oblique interest. It occurred to me that I was not the same art student who went to the Himalayas. I had a greater degree of acceptance. I had far less need to put spins and twists into my work. I could simply be creative without the compulsion to personalise everything according to any penchant for weirdness. Weirdness had been part of the hippie gestalt but that gestalt was fading. Although I still enjoyed sartorialism as art, it was no longer de rigueur to be outrageous. And I was never really outré per se. Most people on the foundation year at Farnham were gaudier by far. I enjoyed their appearance but I was never drawn to vivid velvet and floral flamboyance. As an illustrator, I simply rejoiced in the use of the facilities and being supplied with materials. I was happy simply to develop old skills and learn new skills. I was engaged upon an adventure into the realm of word and image. Derek Crow, the head of illustration, was a marvellous man, open-minded, friendly and enthusiastic. By the later part of the first term, I'd met Det, Claudette Gascoigne, and was in a romantic relationship again. It transpired as an accident of circumstances. I'd had no intention of taking up with anyone, but Det was a good conversationalist and one thing had simply led to another. If I'd have had the intention, I would have been looking for a young lady who was at least interested in Eastern religions. As it was, I simply allowed life to happen. In someone with realisation, that could have been perfect. But with me, it was merely the roulette wheel of random destinies. Det was a highly cultured lady. She loved attending the three Bristol theatres. Her plan was to become a theatre wardrobe designer and she had thus chosen the fashion and textiles degree course at Bower Aston. With everyday contact, our relationship blossomed rapidly. Det was intelligent, highly witty in Dorothy Parker mode, and a walking, sitting and otherwise lounging book of classical quotations. She sometimes made me feel so entirely plebeian that I wondered what the attraction was for her. I had my own native wit and knowledge of the arts. I had a smattering of quotations, mainly Shakespeare and blues. But beyond that, it was evident that I was a card-carrying, primitive autodidact. I had not attended a private school. I'd never learned Latin, toured museums, art galleries or theatres. I hadn't sat in prestigious seats at the opera houses of Europe. Amsterdam, Athens, Avignon, Bruges, Florence, Geneva, Graz, Lille, Madrid, Marseille, Paris, Rotterdam, Venice and Vienna. There were others too, but I lost count. Well, I'd been to a few places in Germany and, of course, India and Nepal. The East was probably my saving grace, 
but for the fact that I'd not seen the Taj Mahal or anything else with which Det had had a passing familiarity. She thought that Kyabje Dujum Rinpoche, the head of the Nyingma tradition, must be equivalent to the Pope. I'd had no desire to impress her on that basis, but neither could I take issue with her assumption. Is he more important than the Dalai Lama? Det asked. To me, yes, I found myself struggling for words, and to an unquantifiable percentage of Nyingmas, you know, this is not really a question I can answer easily. Not briefly, anyway. Well, you begin and I'll tell you when I know enough for general purposes. Right, I almost sighed. The Dalai Lama is like the King of Tibet, although not in a secular monarchic sense. You see, because Tibet was a theocracy, he was also the emblematic spiritual head of Tibet. He's now the political head of Tibet in exile. The heads of the four schools are, however, not subordinate to him in a definitive hierarchic sense. Each lineage head is supreme in each lineage and the Dalai Lama doesn't interfere in the separate lineages. I noticed debt glaze over a little, and so I curtailed what could have been a three hours lecture at that point. And debt, slightly grateful, I'd concluded, said, I can see you're an expert on this subject, but I think that is all I can take in at the moment. I think that's all you really need to know, I smiled. I'm far from being an expert, however, in fact, the more I learn, the more I realise there is to learn. I had some notion that she might become interested in Vajrayana, so I thought I should probably be careful with my answers to her questions. My answers needed only serve to allow her interest to grow, as it had grown with Frank Berner. I'd simply answered Frank's questions, and he'd found himself moving inexorably towards the point at which he felt that he could embrace Buddhism. There was no obvious reason why the same could not happen in the case of debt. I was trying to be careful. I'd been advised in terms of ladies that I should find someone who would be a practitioner. Well, practitioners were not exactly common in Britain. So all I could hope is that a lady might become interested if I appeared to be a sufficiently interesting result of practice. I could not simply wait for a female Western Nyingma Vajrayana practitioner to appear, as the chances of that were extremely slim. I spent the first term in a bedsit in Chesterfield Roads and Andrews. But before the second term commenced, three friends of debts were looking for a fourth girl to share a rented house in Hotwells. I was, at debts suggestion, a postulate as the fourth girl. Debt was keen on the idea for various reasons. The first was that she hated my bedsit. She de described it as something from down and out in Paris and London. The second reason was that parking her Rolls Royce Silver Cloud in St Andrews was asking to have it stolen or vandalised. The third was that she'd rather visit me in elegant surroundings. And the final reason was that it would be cheaper and more spacious for me. 
the renting agency would only accept female applicants. And Det's three friends attending the College of Music and Drama were unable to find a fourth. Without a fourth, they'd lose the house. And so I was their last hope. I'd met the ladies briefly in my bedsit and they'd observed my living situation. Their verdict was that I was odourless, hygienic, orderly and pleasant. I passed the test. They apparently found me a little shy, which was a point in my favour. They had no wish to live with someone brash, boisterous, bombastic and bumptious. Well, I wasn't too brash, boisterous, blustering, bombastic, boastful or bumptious, but neither was I shy. I was simply a little old-fashioned. Politeness and courtesy had been schooled into me by my parents. I could have rebelled against that training, but decided that it was something I valued, especially as it was not the standard mode with young people. I was therefore registered at the agency as Miss Victoria Hilary Simerson, the part being played by debt. My chequebook was inscribed with the name V. H. Simerson. I was Victor Howard Simerson, but saw no reason to use my first names on a chequebook when it was not required. And so yet another fictional entity came into existence. Chugyam, in addition to being Frank and Victor, was now also Victoria. I was to live in the attic rooms where I was least likely to draw attention should the renting agent come to check the house. Within days I'd moved my clothing and appurtenances into the attic room in Hotwells and was soon to come and sit with my new housemates. So there I was, sitting in the drawing room of an exquisite house with three young ladies I hardly knew. They were good long-standing friends of debt. Penelope had rather an intimidating surname, Cholmondeley, pronounced Chumley. She didn't like being contracted to Penny, and as I had no desire to contract her, there was no barrier to our friendship. Rebecca and Merrill had names less intimidating, but equally as impressive. Rebecca Albemarle and Merrill Stanhope. They were evidently top draw, upper circle or whatever, and I wondered if they'd be anything like Todd, because if they were, I was not destined for a fabulously pleasant time in Hotwells. Todd Welcome and Veranda Nugent were two middle to upper middle class persons on the illustration course and they'd taken an almost instant dislike to me on the basis that I was a working class upstart with pretensions above my station. Pretensions as to what was not clear. My clothing clearly upset them but for reasons I was unable to fathom. I was later to discover that only rock celebrities were supposed to affect the sort of attire I wore. Dark blue, ankle length, civil defence, great coat, emerald green leather jacket and waistcoat, high collared indigo moss crepe shirt, dark brown Cuban heeled Chelsea boots, and the standard Levi 501 Serge de Nîmes shrink to fit button fly trousers which went with everything. That was an average costume for me at the time. 
in fact from 1966 to the present day. My wardrobe has expanded but it has remained stylistically similar. Be that as it may, how was I to know what rock celebrities were supposed to wear? Still, Det liked me and she was obviously some sort of debutante. And I say, oh, come on now, you know about my debutante. And she says, your debutante just knows what you need, but I know what you want. Oh, mama, can this really be the end? To be stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. What was a debutante anyway? I had no exact idea. All I knew was that Hot Wells was a long way from Bodamath in Nepal, where I'd studied with Dujam Rinpoche. I'd have to research the word debutante. I didn't like knowing words by their sound, but having no clear concept of what they meant. I realised it was probably some young lady with a wealthy background, but I was sure it must have some more precise meaning. I checked my dictionary and there it was. I was none the wiser. A debutante is a person making a debut. From that description, the members of the Savage Cabbage Blues Band were all debutantes on their first gig at Wayflood Village Hall. Oh, mama, can this really be the end? To be stuck inside of hot wells with Burke's Peerage Blues again. The three ladies sat on the couch looking at me. They'd provided tea. We sat politely drinking it. I remarked upon the weather. They agreed that it was pleasant. Unusually mild for the time of year, Merrill added with what appeared to be a well-hidden grin. Quite so, I nodded. I wouldn't be surprised if there were not a few croci to be seen. Merrill's grin then became slightly more visible. You have an impeccable sense of the Latin plural. Then they all burst out laughing and Rebecca said, we're all sitting here sounding like something out of Jane Austen. And I'm sure she would be proud of us, as would King Richard II. Then I quoted. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this bar of Mars, this other Ealing, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself, against infection and the hand of war. This hippie breed, this samovar, this precious tea set in a silver urn, which serves its office to us all, or as a cake delicious to a mouse, against the envy of less grand demands, this blessed teapot, this hearth, this tiffin, this England. I didn't expect a literary soiree, Merrill giggled. No one expects the literary soiree, I replied a la Monty Python with mock drama. Oh, that's too funny, especially this hippie breed, this samovar, Penelope laughed. I can see we shall be quite jolly here. I hope so, I replied but thought, when can I have a cup of coffee? I hadn't got round to telling them that I didn't really drink tea that often. I was a useless Englishman. I drank coffee, black and strong, with no sugar. It was a custom I'd developed staying with relatives in Germany. Tea was fine, in fact preferable with a big fried English breakfast. Cornish pasties or Christmas cake. But for all other purposes, give me coffee or give me death. The English drink tea all day long, it seemed. 
A pot of tea is brewed almost every hour of the day. But after my morning pint of coffee, I go over to fruit juice, half and half with carbonated water. The ladies had been in residence for a week before I moved in, and now we were having a get acquainted soiree. It had felt a little like an interview with the three of them facing me, till I used the unnecessary Latin plural of crocus. Things eased out at that point, but there was still a slight feeling of wariness. I decided to launch forth again. I'm glad to be here, I commenced. It's a lovely house, so thank you very much indeed for being willing to take me in. My bedsit was somewhat grim, so it's nice to have a room that's not multi-purpose. I'm glad to see the last of the wretched Oso oh call and the evil baby belling too. An Oso oh call, Merrill laughed. What's that? Where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise, I laughed. It's some sort of attempt at refrigeration. It's a nasty plaster box lined with zinc. It has an aluminium door lined with polystyrene, which is supposed to keep the heat out. The vile object has a depression, apt word, in the top into which you're, you pour a little water every day. That's supposed to lower the temperature of the inside of the box. Does it work? asked Rebecca. Not as far as I could ever tell, but then I never tested the inside and against the outside with a thermometer, so I suppose I'll never know. I'd say that if it was cooler inside the box, it could only have been a degree at the most. Get thee behind me, Satan, I say. That made Penelope laugh, and I was delighted to have broken the ice again. Welcome to the wonderful world of real refrigerators, she laughed. I'm both privileged and delighted, I replied. I shall install a few choice cheeses later, if I may. You surely may. We all love cheese. The stinkier, the better, Merrill grinned. Can I ask, though, do you always speak like this? I mean sort of old-fashioned? Or have you taken part in amateur dramatics? Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. Not at all. And yes, I've always tried to speak with some kind of... Words failed me. Je ne sais quoi? Merrill offered. I don't know what either. Uh, comme les femmes françaises, perhaps. But yes, that's exactly what I want of my speech. You're a hoot, Rebecca laughed. I think we're going to have fun together. I must say that I was a bit, not exactly anxious, but cautious about how it would work out. But it seems that if we go on the way we've started, it'll all be great fun. <laughs>